In 1919, precisely 100 years ago, a new political force emerged on the European scene, fascism. That force first originated as a movement, Fasci di Combattimento, in Milan in 1919. Two years later, it established itself as a party. And in 1922, it also formed a government as part of a larger coalition. In 1925, that political force established a dictatorship. That regime, Mussolini's fascist Italy, was emulated throughout Europe. And then in the 1930s, we have a vast network of uh, related regimes that really led to the catastrophe of the Second World War that marked uh, European and world history. Uh, to mark this dark anniversary, the International Association for Comparative Fascist Studies initiated a series of discussions about the history, legacy, and current prospects of fascism. Uh, my name is Konstantin Yordaki. I'm a professor at the Central European University. I'm joined here by Professor Roger Griffin from Oxford Brookes University. Professor Griffin, how can we explain the sudden but also meteoritic uh, success of fascism in the interior period? Well, this has been a problem <clears throat> that has taxed uh, academics uh, ever since 1919. Uh, famously, Gramsci uh, wrestled with the problem that the objective factors for uh, the next revolution favoured a Marxist revolution, and he sat in prison under fascism trying to explain why it was fascism and not Marxism. Marxism has never really resolved the, the problem of fascism because its appeal is so irrational and so mythical. Uh, in the non-Marxist academia, uh, there's been a, an enormous amount written about Nazism, which I think has now reached a point of relative clarity about how Nazism succeeded. But when we talk about fascism generally, uh, it's more complicated. I think what is very clear now is that liberals, uh, liberal intellectuals, liberal governments massively underestimated the impact of the First World War on, uh, on liberal democratic ideas of civilization. Uh, a little bit like the British government mis uh, misunderstood the antagonism to European politics. So, on a much bigger scale, liberal intellectual elites in Europe and the ruling classes massively underestimated how the whole concept of the future and of civilization had been undermined by the First World War, leaving a, a political space, a political vacuum that could be filled either by revolutionary politics on the left or by a new form of revolutionary politics on the right, and that was fascism. And once there was a consensus that the Russian Revolution was not to be emulated in Western Europe. This really created a, a, a momentum behind nationalist-based politics, which swept aside liberal democracies in country after country. Yeah, so we could say on one hand that on short term fascism had a remarkable success. Yeah. It used innovative uh, techniques uh, of uh, propaganda and mm. mobilization and really, as you said, uh, managed to sweep away liberal democracies. On the other hand, fascism had some structural weaknesses which um, accounts for the fact that fascist regimes were short-lived and ended in catastrophe. Mm. So what were, in your opinion, the, the weaknesses of fascism? Well, I sometimes uh, compare the success of fascism to a sort of mad affair, like a mad passion between two people who are ultimately incompatible. And it, you used the phrase meteoric before. Um, many people at the time were, were staggered by how much uh, f fascism in Italy and then Nazism in Germany seemed to be able to take over the entire country with displays of public enthusiasm, which had not been seen for political... Uh, forces under liberalism. You never had a mass effect. Where you had had a, uh, millions of people collectively out in the streets was for nationalism in the First World War. You had First World War fever in some countries. So I think the, 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 the initial success of fascism, where there was success, we must remember that it was marginalized in many countries, but certainly uh, in, in Italy and Germany, was the fact that in both countries there was a very profound sense of the inadequacy of, of democratic politics. Uh, Gelitian politics in, in Italy f was felt to have failed Italy. You have massive enthusiasm for D'Annunzio in Fiume, which is a sort of forerunner of fascism. In Germany, after the Wall Street crash, there was a real collapse of faith in Weimar. And suddenly you had this redemptive form of politics pros promising a rebirth and a new Germany, a new Italy, and millions of 
quite ordinary people fell for this myth. Now, the trouble with fascism, of course, is if, if at the heart of it is a form of aggressive imperialistic nationalism. And once it hits reality, it, it's bound to create war and violence. It's also bound to create outgroups, particularly in Nazism, which created a whole series of categories of human beings who could not be part of this new Germany. So the realities of Nazism were war and persecution. And in a sense, immediately Germany became locked in an imperialist struggle with Russia, America, and the West, it, it was doomed. Uh, the nemesis of fascism is in the attempt to fulfill its massive, uh, massively over-optimistic view of its future. It's an unsustainable vision. Uh, it is not based on, on any sort of gradualism or sustainability. And of course, the other great weakness of fascism is its dependency on charismatic leadership. And it's a very unstable form of politics which is based on a single personal dictatorship uh, where, which can only really work while there is success. Immediately failure hit the fascist regime in Italy and immediately there were reversals in Russia and uh, the myth of Nazism moves from success to a sort of last stand against the enemy then both Nazism and fascism were doomed. So it is an intrinsically unstable and short-lived explosion of popular energy. Yeah, fascism is both a transnational and national phenomenon. Mm. On one hand, we have a European-wide phenomenon of radicalization that yeah. led to many laboratories of fascism. Yeah. And we could speak about the French-Italian laboratory or the Austrian-German mm. or Romania or Croatia. On the other hand, all fascist movements took national coloring. Yeah. They have their uh, own specificities. Mm. How, do, how can we define fascism then? What are the common elements of uh, fascist mm. movements? The common denominator of all uh, fascisms, uh, as uh, I and the m modern fascist studies tend to uh, accept, is the idea that you have a, a nation in crisis, and this, na this crisis can be reversed if we get rid of the liberal democracy, which is part of the problem which is making the country weak. We can get rid of all the enemy ideologies and the, the forces which are undermining the nation, including international bodies. Now, if you're a modern fascist, you hate United Nations, you hate globalization, you hate multiculturalism, you hate refugees coming in and destroying your, your, your homogeneity, which is mythical, of course. And you then have a strong government which will create this mythical rebirth. And uh, that idea of a national rebirth, you can see it in a much weaker form in modern populism. I mean, when Trump talks about making America great again, it's a very vague formula, and it's very interesting that some real hardcore American Nazi fascists uh, uh, could actually see in Trump a sort of, uh, like a Trojan horse entering the American constitutional politics with their slogan. But of course, I don't believe that Trump or most of the voters for Trump saw it in fascist terms. But it's the, it's the power of this rebirth myth, which I call palingenetic, which can be seen as the common denominator between all weak fascisms. Immediately have a strong racist fascism based on superiority, then there, there can be no basis for international solidarity. Can I just say at the end of that that universal Nazism uh, you can now be a Nazi in, in Australia or, or South America or whatever, because there you've abandoned the idea of nationalism, and there the, uh, it is the white race which is the common denominator, which is supranational, and that's a very interesting way fascism has evolved since 1945. Yeah, this leads us to an unavoidable question. Mm -hmm. uh, can we have a fascist rebirth nowadays? Generally, there are two approaches to fascism. One is to look at it as a epochal, uh, European epochal phenomenon yeah. specific to the interperiod. And another approach is to define fascism as a universal generic phenomenon. Mm. Do you think we can experience a fascist rebirth nowadays? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I occupy a sort of middle position there. I think there, I, I distinguish between a sort of classic era of fascism. I actually do believe there was a fascist era. That doesn't mean to say that all the right-wing dictatorships are fascist. Um, I've be recently been at a very important conference in Portugal, which was looking at Salar Salazarism. Now, Salazar was not personally a fascist, but the intellectuals and the politics uh, under Salazar were very much drawn by the gravitational pull of the Axis powers. So they were part of the fascist era without being fascist. And I believe that in the interwar period, fascism uh, with Bolshevism, both 
had a massive impact on how the, the era was experienced. Since the war, there, there, it can, there can be no talk of a fascist era. Uh, however, um, there are really, uh, I believe that fascism as a revolutionary force is permanently marginalized. I believe that the hegemony of liberal democracy and constitutional states, even when they're not liberal constitutional states, um, is so strong now and the terrible uh, events of the Holocaust and the Second World War have traumatized the memories of people so much that the rhetoric of rebirth under a, a, a totalitarian regime really has no traction now. What I do find interesting is that A, there are still many fascists in the world collectively. If you, uh, if you look at, think of cyber fascism, fascist websites and little group of schools all over the world, there are still fascists around and they do affect and pull to the right uh, mainstream politics. Uh, so, and these people are still working for some sort of fascist rebirth. I don't think there's any chance practically of there being a, a new uh, fascist state, but I do believe that the most radical forms of populism can be seen as the equivalent of interwar fascism, but adapted to an age where constitutional democratic politics is now hegemonic and is not in the sort of crisis it was after the First World War. Yeah, yeah. So um, it is often said that uh, the Holocaust was an immensely costly learning experience for humanity. Uh, now, 100 years from the birth of fascism and 70 years from the collapse of fascism, this question is still with us. Can we learn from the lessons of history? Or maybe each generation uh, learns from experience, which means unavoidably it, it uh, repeats uh, uh, historical mistakes. Um, so I think in this context, it is very, the work of historians is very important because the general public has to be informed and has to recognize fascism uh, whenever it appears, uh, keeping in mind, of course, that uh, history never repeats itself in the same form. Professor Griffin, thank you very much. Thank you.